Hi, welcome to IC503 and we are starting a new chapter which is relational databases and this is the very first lecture on relational databases. The lecture slides are from our textbook Principles of Database Management. Okay, so here we go. Let's look at the uh, main points that we will discuss. So we will learn about relational model and uh, then we'll uh, look into the very important concept of normalization that will be followed by mapping of a conceptual ER model to a relational model and towards the end we will look at the mapping of the conceptual EER model to a relational model. So uh, let's uh, get slightly deeper into relational model. In relational model we will go over the basic concepts, we will look at the formal definitions, then we will learn about the type of uh, types of keys, then relational constraints, and we will look at the example of relational model. So let's start with the basics, right? So uh, the question arises uh, that who gave us this concept of relational model? So here we have that information, a very uh, famous a uh, smart computer scientist from England named Edgar F. Codd. In 1970, he came with this relational model. Okay, so it was first formalized by computer scientist Edgar F. Codd. And here you have the reference. Uh, this is considered to be a very uh, fundamental research in computer science. And he came up with this paper, which is a relational model of data for large shared data banks and this was published in communications of ACM in 1917. He was awarded Turing Award as well so his uh, contribution is of extreme importance. Now let's see what is this relational model all about. So relational model is a formal data model with a very sound mathematical foundation and in mathematical foundation it's more, more specifically based on the set theory and first order predicate logic so the foundation of relational model is in set theory and first order predicate logic and uh, with the relational model we don't have any graphical representation because of which it is not a good uh, model for conceptual data modeling so for but uh, since it's uh, it, because of its strong mathematical foundation it is commonly adopted to build the remaining two models which are the logical as well as the internal data model right so somebody might ask you uh, like whoa, what is the relational model good for so you should say the relational model is good for logical as well as internal data modeling why not conceptual for this reason that it does not have any graphical representation as we have in er and eer model now let's look at some example of the data dbms which are based on relational model then here we go the microsoft sql server IBM DB2 and Oracle, these are the commercial DBMS systems, right? So commercial uh, database management systems which are based on relational model are these Microsoft SQL Server, IBM DB2 and Oracle. And uh, the, uh, the My, MySQL is the non-commercial or the open source version. So uh, now let, let's see uh, like how is the data represented in a relational model. So a database in a relational data model is represented as collection of relations. Okay, so we will learn about what relations are. Because the, the DBMS that we are uh, learning right now, DBMS, they are called relational DBMS, RDBMS. And here, the data that you'll be storing in the database is in fact collection of relations. So now the question arises fine, what are these relations? So the relation is defined as set of tuples that represent a 
real world entity so yeah you know about entity by now right so the example of entity is um, supplier okay a supplier who is supplying some products is an example of an entity therefore we can have a relation corresponding to supplier and a relation would be def would be defined as the set of tuples and these tuples will represent a, you know an entity from the real world which is going to be supplier in this case similarly we can have relation for uh, an employee a relation for a student a relation for an account okay so these are some example of relations and what is a relation one more time it is defined as a set of tuples that represent a similar real world entity so in supplier relation you will have the information about all the suppliers right so that's what we mean when we are saying that uh, it is a set of tuples that represent a similar real world entity all the records or all the tuples in the supplier are going to be for suppliers real life supplier fine you know so what is happening here uh, the relational database was defined as the collection of relations then we went on to define what is a relation and we said that the relation is the set of tuples and that uh, that relation represents uh, um, the similar real life entities good now uh, we, we uh, introduced a new term tuple now we should find the definition of a tuple what is a tuple so a tuple is an ordered list of attribute values uh, that each describe an aspect of an entity. So one more time, a tuple is an ordered list of attribute values that each describe an aspect of an entity. So for supplier, a supplier can have different uh, aspects like the supplier number, supplier name, supplier address, supplier status. So a tuple in for the supplier relation will be a, uh, you know an ordered list of these values okay and uh, yeah we'll have an example and that example will you know make it a lot uh, you know explicit. So here uh, let's use this example to go over the definitions that we had in the previous slide. So the supplier that you're looking at is a relation supplier is a relation and let's look at it here we have one two three four five and six there are even more but yeah we, we can see only the data for the top six rows so all these rows that we have here are called tuples right so all these are let me use this side over here these are tuples Right, so what is supplier? Supplier is a relation uh, which has sets of uh, tuples. These are all tuples. And now let's try to understand what is a tuple, right? We had the definition in the previous slide and now we will use this example. I will use the second tuple. Okay, and uh, what is the second tuple? We will, uh, you know, apply the definition to this example of the sub uh, second tuple. Now here, every tuple, if you look at, then there is an ordered list, right? This ordering is important. So the first value that you have 32 is for the supplier number aspect of uh, the, the tuple, right? Uh, and then the second one is the, or the entity, let's call it entity. So supplier number value 32 is for the supplier number aspect of the entity supplier. Similarly, the name is Best Wines, the address is 660 Market Street, the uh, supply city is San Francisco, and the supply status is 90, right? So I hope the, with this example, you know, the, uh, the, the definitions that we had in the previous slide are making sense, right? So we start, uh, in the previous slide, we had the definition of the relational database. In relational database, we will have the data in relations. What is a relation? Rela relation is the set of tuples. Okay, and uh, the relation is the set of tuples, and each relation represents the uh, similar entities, right? Uh, similar entity types or entities rather. And then uh, the question arises: What is a tuple? Tuple is uh, the ordered list of 
the values, attribute values, I think, uh, which rep represents some aspect of the entity, right? So the, these definitions we had in the slide, right? And then I applied all these definitions to the example over here. Let's keep moving. Guys, these are going to be important, okay? So make sure that you understand these basic definitions related with relational databases. Okay, so now let's map these things that we are learning in relational model with EER model. So the relation that we have just defined corresponds to the concept of entity type and EER model. And the tuple that you have or you will have in a relation would correspond to an entity or the entity instance you may call it. The column name, I'll go back and I'll show you what these column names are. The column names in relational model, they correspond to attribute type in EER model. And the cell in the relational model corresponds to an attribute in EER model. So let's go back here. All these things that you see, the column headings, right? They are called the columns. So for this relation supplier, we have five columns. Uh, supplier NR, which is supplier number, sub name for supplier name, sub address for supplier address, sub cities for supplier city, and sub status for supplier status. Now all these things, right? We can pick any cell like this 37. What is 37? So 37 is in fact the attribute value. Okay, so that's what we have the cell. So attribute value corresponds to the cell in this relation. Attribute value attribute, that's the same thing. Okay, so this mapping would be important too, although it is very simple, but yeah, you never know. These things could be important as well. Now we will look at some example of relation. Okay, so you're looking at the very first relation here named student, and that student will have uh, the uh, tuples with these column names, right? So I should say the, the relation and the column name, right? That should be fine. Let's not go into more details of tuples right here. So student uh, relation will have the column name student number, student NR, name, home phone, and address. We have another relation here for professor. And professor relation will have the column uh, column names SSN for social security number, name, home phone, office phone, and email. Then we have the course. The course relation has two columns, course number and course theme. So, you know, uh, we can think of our database, relational database, comprising of just these three relations. Okay, and yeah, that is a good example to think about how the data is stored in a relational database, right? A very simple, very minimalistic uh, relational database with just three relations, student, professor, and course. All right, so now we'll have a more formal definitions. Let's see what these definitions are and why are they important. So the very first definition we'll go over is about a domain. So what is a domain? A domain specifies the range of admissible values for an attribute type. Example, we can have the gender domain, we can have time domain, we can have excuse me, student number domain, so on. So what will a domain uh, determine? Domain will give us the legal values then an ad that an attribute can take. We have to define the domain. All right, so here the definition that we have for domain is that a domain specifies the range of admissible values for an attribute type. So the uh, for gender, gender it could, it could be an attribute type. For gender, we'll have to specify what is the domain for gender. Like what values we will allow for a gender attribute type to take. Similarly, we can define the time domain. Now, each attribute type is defined using the corresponding domain. Okay, good. A domain can be used multiple times in a relation. That is a very interesting fact, which is kind of highlighting the importance of a domain. 
okay so this is something we do we define our domain and that domain can be used in to define uh, or to declare multiple uh, attribute types so that's the message over here a domain can be used uh, multiple types in a relation we will uh, we'll have some example so uh, let's look at this uh, relation which is bill of material okay so let's assume that uh, we have um, the product number okay so it's it says major product number minor product number but major and minor product number relates with the product number only okay so if we have this understanding that the product number is going to be in the range from 1 to 9999 9999 if you know this range if you know the range that the product number product and r let's for for all the products that we have in a product um, relation right let's think that their product number will range from 1 to 9999 then we can define a, a domain for product number right and that domain can be used for these two columns which is major product number as well as minor product number right so that is so much flexible and uh, later on let's say if uh, some uh, need changes and in future we would say okay fine now we have we are getting more products so uh, let's increase the range from 1 1 to 9999 to 99999 something like that right so we'll have to only change the uh, the domain we won't have to change every you know attribute attribute type or the column type so that is a lot of flexibility so uh, if you if you're wondering like what kind of information we'll have in this bill of material major product number minor product number and quantity so i do remember one example from our textbook where they are citing that let's say that we have a store that deals with bicycle bicycles right so in the bicycles uh, you will sell the bicycle and in that will be the major product would be the bicycle and then with the major uh, with that major bicycle product we will have some minor products also like you know the wheels of the bicycle all right so yeah that kind of um, uh, situation we can have but the message over here is that the domain definition is important once we create a domain once we define the domain that domain then that domain can be used to define the column names later on or the attribute types later on so that they use a value from that domain okay so after having the understanding of domain let's move on and try to for, to have the formal definition of a relation here you will find some mathematical notations so uh uh, don't you know uh, don't be scared of those here I can see that there is there are some typos so let me fix that typo this n should be uh, subscript right so a1 a2 a3 a n and is uh, you know in the bottom similarly this tm m should be over here right subscript so a relation r with the columns a1 a2 a3 to a n can now be formally defined as a set of m tuples right what are these tuples uh, r r means the whole relation that we have r would be r would stand for the state of relation okay so the state of relation means all the tuples that you have in that relation okay so in this uh, definition a relation r which has these n attributes a sub 1 a sub 2 a sub 3 all the way to a n can now be formally defined as a set of m tuples r right so there are m rows in our relation and each row or each tuple is has been noted uh, has been notified as t1 t2 t3 all the way to your tm whereby each tuple t is an order list of n values right so all these things we have already learned but now we are putting everything together in one formal definition 
So uh, yeah, in this uh, relation R, there are m tuples, t1 to tm, and each tuple, let's consider tuple t, is an ordered uh, list of n values. What are these values? You know, we are using angle brackets for notation, v1, v2, v3, and vn. Okay, they all correspond to a particular entity. So this is one entity, there will be another entity. There are going to be m entities in this case. Now each value vi that you have is an element of the corresponding domain, dom of ai. Here I should be, you know, subscript here, ai, or it should be null. All right, so there are some notational typos. I apologize about that. Okay, good. So what we are trying to say here is that for a tuple T, these values that you have V1, then this V1 is coming from the domain of A1. The second value V2 that you have is coming from domain of A2, so on and so forth. This Vn that you have, that value is coming from the domain of An. So each of these values vi is an element of the corresponding domain, dom, uh, dom of ai, by dom we mean domain, or is a special value null. We will discuss about null in the next bullet, I think. What is null? Well, null is very important for us because null can mean a number of things. A null value means that the value is missing, the value is irrelevant, or the value is not applicable. Okay, so in in these diff different uh, situations or contexts, we may use null. All right, so now let's look at some uh, some uh, examples. So here are the student tuple, right? So this is a student tuple, uh, and the, the this is the student number hundred. Then we have the name of the student, Michael J uh, Johnson. Then we have the phone number of the student. And then finally, we have the address of the student. Okay. Similarly, we have another tuple for the for professor relation. 50 is the, the, uh, the SSN. Name of the professor is Bart Beeson. And then null is probably the home phone number. Then the next is the, uh, the phone number followed by the email of the professor. Okay. Similarly, we have the information about course as well. Course relation has 10 as the course number. Uh, principle of database management is the, the, uh, the name of the course. So um, another very interesting thing about relation that we need to remember is that a relation essentially represents a set, right? So, so when you say set, then the set has no ordering there. Right? So ordering information is naturally not there and ordering is not important for a set and relation is basically a set of tuples. So ordering is not important and the duplicates are not allowed. The sets don't have duplicates. All right. So these things you need to keep in mind for a relation. Ordering is not important, no ordering, and the duplicates are also not allowed. In a table, we cannot have duplicate, or in a relation instance, we cannot have duplicates. The domain constraint, right, that's an important uh, thing that we are about to learn. The domain constraint, right? Sometimes people ask this question, like, what do you mean by domain constraint? So the domain constraint states that the value of each attribute type A must be an atomic. These keywords are important, right? So the value of each attribute type A must be atomic, must be single valued, and should come from the domain of A, right? That is our domain constraint. So what does the domain constraint say? One more time, domain constraint of an each attribute type A must be atomic, should be single value and that value should be coming from the domain of attribute type A. Let's look at an example. So if we have the relation course, right, then the course is defined using these columns or these attribute types, which are course number, course name, study points. Then see what we have here. The course number is 10, good. This is what atomic, right? And then this is single value, only one value is there, 10. 
and uh, yeah it is coming from the domain of course number right so the course number can be assumed to have uh, to be in the range from 1 to 9999 okay great and uh, yeah the course name principle of database management that is atomic and that is uh, what single valued and it is coming from the domain and the study points are six fine so this is good right that that, that is in accordance with the domain constraint that's what we are learning here domain constraint how about the next example which we have in red okay so let's look at it this is also um, an example of the tuple from course let's see what's wrong over here so the course number is fine this is atomic single valued but if we look at the course name then here in course name there are two course names right principles of database management one and database modeling two okay so we cannot have multiple values for the second attribute type course name okay so this is against the domain constraint right so we are calling it as wrong this is fine this is fine but the course name is not correct because we have what we have the uh we have we we need single values we have multiple values there okay so let's keep moving uh one more interesting observation about the relation is that a relation r of degree n on the domains dom a1 dom a2 dom a3 up to dom a n can also be alternatively defined as a subset of the cartesian product of the domain that defines each attribute type right so this might sound little tricky initially but if you you know put your math you know skill there then yeah it will make a lot of sense right so uh, what i have i have an example using that example i will explain what what is this definition saying okay so uh one more time i'll read this definition and then i'll show you the example and we will uh, put that example in this context of the definition so a relation r with a degree n so here the degree means how many attributes do you have right so a relation means a table uh, relation means a a table right well, we will very very soon uh, converge to that understanding that the relation is a table of rows and columns but anyway a relation r with degree n n means the number of attributes or the number of columns on the domains of a1 a2 a3 dom a1 dom a2 dom a3 that means the domain of each column can be alternatively defined as the subset of the cartesian product of the domain that define each attribute types let's look at an example that will you know help us out a lot let's see let's think about a relation r that will be um, you know that will have three do uh, three attribute types the product id the product color and the product category right so uh, our r is going to have these th three things product id product color and product category now here we are looking at the domain of these three attribute types so for product id we have the id starting from one two three there are more but we don't want to consider remaining we want to keep it very simple similarly the the domain of the product color is going to be blue red and black right so for color these are the three colors we are looking at product category are, is going to be a b and c okay now you have to think about sets right in the sets we do have the cartesian products so now so if you do this cartesian product of you know uh, from the domain of product id then uh, to the domain of product color followed by the domain of product category so we are doing two cartesian products one with a domain to domain product color a domain product id to domain product color and then the result with the domain product um, category so what we'll have what we will have is shown in the table below 
So the question arises, how are we generating this table, right? So this table in the bottom is simply the Cartesian product of these three domains. So how do we get these values? Well, we will start with the product ID 1, right? Let's combine that with uh, the first color, which is blue. And then with, uh, zero, zero, with zero, 0, 1 and blue, we will have three combinations, three different combinations, right? That's what you would find here. 0, 0, 001 blue a 0, 0, 001 blue b 0, 0, 001 blue and c right so that's the cartesian product thing then what we will do we will keep the product um, id as 0, 0, 001 and we'll choose the second color red and with the second color red again we'll have three product categories right so that's what you would see in the next three rows 0, 0, 001 red a 001 red b 001 red c right so that's how we are you know generating the cartesian product and what will happen in reality one uh, one state of this relation state means one uh, one table with the tuples will have a subset from this category right of course so we'll have the subset from this cartesian product all right so that's what we are seeing here a relation r of degree n on the domain dom a1 dom a2 dom a3 till dom a n can be alternatively defined as the subset of the cartesian product of the domains that define each of these attributes right so this interpretation could be interesting and important at the same time so make sure that you followed it now what we will do, let's look at the, uh, the concept of keys. Keys are extremely important in the relational data models. So we will learn about super key, the super keys, then keys, that will be followed by the understanding of candidate keys, primary keys, alternative keys, and finally, we will learn about foreign keys. So let's start with a super key. What is a super key? Guys, these definitions that I have in the previous slide, they are all extremely important. So please pay proper attention to um, these definitions and discussion that is to come. A super key. A super key is defined as a subset of attribute types of a relation R with the property that no two tuples in any relation state would have the same combination of values for these attribute types. Okay, so super key or would be uh, you know these um, attributes a uh, sum of attribute uh, sorry the set of attribute types such that they are unique across the tuples that's what we mean okay Sim in simple words a super key let's stick to the definition here you can have your own definition but that definition should have all these key important things right so you should not miss the send the key idea in your definition so a super key let me put some stars here is defined as the subset of attribute types of a relation R with the property that no two tuples in any relation state would have the same combination of values for these attribute types. So uh, because of this property that we have in the, fir in the first bullet, a super key specifies a uniqueness constraint uniqueness constraint means that if these attributes that you are uh, picking for a super key they should have the unique values across the tuples in the relation okay so in a way super key specifies a uniqueness constraint now it is possible that a super key can have redundant attribute types so this is something we have to understand with the help of an example that will be the best approach to understand this concept it says that a super key can have redundant attribute types so let's look at an example for a uh, for the uh, student re, uh, student relation if you could un, uh, recollect we had defined the student relation with these attributes student number name home phone and i think we had one more 
a, a attribute type which was the address all right so for that relation these three attributes if you take together in a set right like student number name and home phone then this is a super key why because if you have say uh, 100 students in your in your uh, relation in your relation state right if you have 100 students then the for these three columns student number name and home phone these combinations are going to be unique you won't be able to find two two um, uh, two sets with the same values why because these are super keys now this example is about the fact that a super key can have redundant attribute types so what do we mean by redundant attribute types so guys redundant means that if you look at the super key right then the uniqueness constraint is satisfied by uh, the student number in itself right so if you take student number then that is enough right you don't you may not need name and you may not need home phone so when we say that a super key uh, may have the redundant attribute types, that simply means that out of the super key that we have over here, let me call that one, you can have a subset with just student number and that will be a super key again. Okay, so that's the point we are trying to explain here. Good. Let's move on to the next definition of a key. What is a key? A key K of a relation schema R is a super key of R with the additional property that removing any attribute type from K leaves a set of attribute type that is not a super key of R. Okay, so in fact, what we are trying to explain in this um, definition is that the, the key is a super key which is minimal, right? So sometimes in some text, uh, the definition of key would be given like this that key is a minimal super key minimal means that if you remove any attribute from your super key then uh, what you get will not be a super key if that's the case then what you had initially in the super key is your key so a key does not have any redundant attribute types right so it's minimal super key that's what i was trying to emphasize the, the difference between a super key and a key is that a key is a super key but a super key may not be a key always because a super key may have some redundant attributes whereas the uh, the key that we have is a minimal super key right you cannot have any redundant attribute in your key so an example of a key is student number right there's only one attribute here you cannot remove student number right so since we have only one attribute here and it's a primary it's a, the super key so yeah we don't have any redundancy it's minimal minimal super key fine so we have another constraint over here which is called the key constraint what is this key constraint we have already seen the domain constraint right so please remember the domain constraint and then we'll learn about another constraint that is called a key constraint a key constraint states that every relation must have at least one key that allows to uniquely identify its tuples right so please do remember this thing right what is it the key constraint says that every relation must have at least one key that would allow us to uniquely identify the tuples from that relation okay simple enough fine so you know the chances are that we may have more than one key right so that's where we are going so that this definition that you see here the candidate key uh you know captures that that concept so here we go a relation may have more than one key if that's the case then we will consider all those uh, keys as the candidate keys okay so one more time a relation may have more than one key example let's think about product relation and in the product relation if we are uh, told that the two attributes for the product relation like product number and product name they are unique Right? So, which means that we don't have two products with the same name in our product relation. Then, yeah, product name column satisfies the condition of a key. 
right? It's a minimal super key then. So is the case with product number. So if we have that kind of scenario, then we will consider product number as well as product name as the candidate keys, right? Any one of these could be uh, used as a key because they both satisfy the condition that they are unique across tuples. Now, uh, out of these two, we can pick one of the, those attributes as the primary key. So the primary key, let's assume that we pick the, the product number as the primary key. So the, uh, yeah, the primary key, once you pick, is used to identify tuples in a relation and also to establish connections to other relation and also for storage purposes, right? So these things we will learn, like how can we use the primary key to establish a connection with other, other relation. So that's what you will find in the next few slides. Okay, so one of the key can be picked as a primary key. Once you pick that primary key, then yeah, that will be used for establishing the, um, the connection with other relations relations and also for the storage purpose fine we have another interesting constraint which is called the entity integrity constraint so what is this entity integrity constraint this is the third constraint right we learned about domain constraint then we learned about key constraint and now this is the third constraint which is entity integrity constraint it says that the attribute types that make up the primary key should always satisfy not null constraints. So that means that if you have a, um, a you know, the primary key like a product number, then your yeah, product number cannot take the null value. Okay, so there is another constraint which is applied on the key attribute that is not null. They cannot take a null value that is called entity integrity constraint now once you pick uh, an attribute as the primary key like the product number then the other candidate keys are referred to as an alternative keys right so in our example of product if i pick product number as the primary key then product name is going to be my alternative key foreign keys right the most interesting thing is over here what is a foreign key all right, so this definition is in fact interesting, little tricky as well. So here we go. A set of attribute types FK in a relation R1 is a foreign key of the relation R1 if two conditions are satisfied, right? And these conditions are collectively called as referential integrity constraint. So this is the fourth constraint. We learned about domain constraint, key constraint, uh, first domain constraint then we learned about key constraint in the last slide we learned about refer, uh, the um, entity integrity constraint I think yeah entity integrity constraint and this is the referential integrity constraint so referential integrity constraint uh, is related with the foreign keys right so we are still to see these conditions but before that let me read this thing uh, one more time just to make sure that you are with me a set of attribute types fk in a relation r1 is a foreign key of r1 if two conditions are satisfied the first condition is that the attribute types in fk have the same domains as the primary key attributes types pk of a relation r2 okay so if you're considering considering one attribute type as a foreign key in your table then yeah that attribute type should have the same domain as the attribute type of another attribute from a different relation r2 then a value fk in a tuple t1 of the current state r1 either occurs as a value of a primary key pk for some tuple t2 in the current state r2 or is null right so here in these two in, in this uh, you know second uh, or the third bullet actually the second the sub bullet we are trying to uh, you know understand the kind of value that we will have in a foreign key attribute right so the value that you have in the foreign key attribute must it must be present in the corresponding primary key attribute in the second table R2 
or it should be null, right? So these are the two conditions, okay? Please make sure that you understand these things, right? Very important. Referential integra integrity constraint is a very important concept in relational database. Fine. So what we will do, we will look at some relations relationships that we learned in ER diagram and we'll try to see how can we uh, you know have that concept in the relational database or the relational data model so uh, if you could recollect in the ER di in in the ER model when we were learning in about EER models and ER models we we had something like this right there are two entities in war supplier entity and the purchase order uh, let me be technically correct as a supplier entity type and purchase order entity type between these two entity type we have a relationship type which is on order okay and look at their cardinalities uh yeah the cardinalities so uh if you look from purchase order to, uh, purchase order to supplier then for each purchase order there's one and only one supplier there's a unique supplier for a purchase order Whereas, if you look from supplier side to the purchase order, then yeah, a supplier can have zero or more than uh, more, uh, you know more than one um, uh, purchase order. So for that reason, we have this cardinality as zero to n from supplier to the purchase order. Good. So for supplier, we will have this relation, supplier relation. Okay, and for supplier relation, we have this column supplier number, supplier name supplier address supplier city and supplier status good and for purchase order we have uh, you know the purchase uh, order number purchase order date and we have supplier number let's ignore that for the time being okay let's assume that this column is not present because we want to you know see how can we have this implementation right on on the left hand side this er diagram that you're looking at is the conceptual data model on the right hand side we are kind of in 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 the you know logical data model thing okay so er diagram is used for conceptual data model fine so for supplier we have supplier number supplier name supplier address supplier city and supplier status now question arises that where should we put the foreign keys right so uh, let's look at the first scenario here we would like to add a foreign key over here right and for that foreign key uh, this will be the foreign key for po number po number okay that's going to be my foreign key and in the po number i will have the purchase order numbers corresponding to a supplier right now let's think about the possibility can i have it or not so if i put a foreign key here for purchase order number in the supplier table then see a supplier can have multiple purchase orders so in that case what will happen in one cell i will be putting multiple entries for the suppliers who have put um, more than one purchase order right which is not uh, which is not supported or which is not um, you know yeah which is not supported by relational database right so this thing is root out you cannot have a foreign key in the supplier because uh, you know in, in it is possible that a supplier can have multiple purchase order so let's think about the other scenario where uh, we may think of putting the supplier number as a foreign key in the purchase order table now this is going to work because you know for each purchase order we have only one supplier right so this solution will work out why because for each purchase order tuple we will have only one foreign key value for each supplier number sorry for each purchase order there's only one supplier all right so yeah this is perfect this is our foreign key good let's keep moving now we will uh, take another example. This example involves uh, two entity types, supplier entity type and the product entity type. And before these two entity type, we have the relationship type, which is supplies. Okay, one supply can supply zero to many, uh, zero to n products. And similarly, one product can be supplied by zero to m supplier. 
right? Now we'll have to evaluate both the possibilities. So the first possibility, if you could put a foreign key here in the supplier table. So if you're putting a foreign key here in the supplier table, then, you know, uh, it is possible that a supplier might be supplying multiple products. So in that case, one cell will have multiple entries, which is not supported by relational model. Right, so that is ruled out. How about putting a foreign key in the product? Well, the foreign key in the product will have the information about supplier number, right? And if you look at from product to supplier, then for one product, we may have multiple suppliers. Again, we'll be in trouble because the chances are that for one product, we may put multiple supplier information, or multiple supplier number. Okay, which is not satisfied, which is not um, supported by a relational model. So what's the solution? Solution is right here, where we will create one more relation called supplies. And in that relation, we will use supplier number as well as the product number as foreign key. So here we will have two foreign keys. Then we can also add the other attributes here in this relation which would have the uh, the properties of the relationship right so yeah here we are not shown that in the in the er diagram but yes for supplies you will have the purchase price this is my pen yeah the purchase price as well as the delivery period right and this makes a lot of sense in the real life as well so you will have to uh, you know make sure that you understand these concepts like uh, why can't we put the foreign key in one of these tables for this many-to-many -many kind of relationship? So what we have here in this slide? Well, a very important slide where we have one table. And in that table, we have all the relational constraints that we have learned. We started with the domain constraint, then we learned about key constraint, then the entity integrity constraint, and finally we learned about referential integrity constraint. So what I'll do, I'll simply read these things and I'll leave it on you people to make sure that you understand those things and remember. So the domain constraint says that the value of each attribute type A must be atomic and single valued from the domain of a good key constraint says that every relation has a key that allows to uniquely identify its tuple. great entity integrity constraint says that the attribute types that makes up the primary key should always satisfy a not null constraint referential integrity constraint a foreign key fk has the same domain as the primary key pk attribute types and it refers to the either uh, an uh, an primary key oh, wait a second let me read that again a foreign key uh, a foreign key fk has the same domain as the primary key pk attribute types it refers to and either occurs in the uh, as a value in the pk or is not right so this is slightly uh, you know concise but has the same information as we had in the previous slide now you are looking at some relations in the relational data model the first relation supplier supplier has the column name supplier number supplier name supply address supply city and supply status out of these attributes, supplier number has been underlined because that is our primary key. Let's move on to the second, uh, you know, relation. Second relation is product. The product has the attribute types, product number, and the product name, product type, available quantity. And out of these, the product number is our primary key and that has been underlined. Now let's move on to the third relation, which is supplies. Supplies has the, uh, uh, the attribute types, supplier number, the product number, purchase price, and delivery period. Out of these, the first two attributes are taken together for the primary key. And one more interesting thing that you should notice is the font. This is italicized. Italicized or slanted. 
so the you know the attributes which are which are italicized means that they are foreign keys right so supplier number uh, is a foreign key and for supplier number the corresponding primary key is supplier number from the supplier table the product number foreign key is getting the value from the product number primary key of the product table right and the supplier number along with the product number together will form the primary key of supplies uh, relation then we have the fourth relation which is purchase order purchase order has the purchase order number purchase order date and supplier number supplier number over here if you look at the fonts then this is italicized meaning that it is the foreign key and for supplier number you're getting this value from the supplier table now the fifth relation that we have here is for purchase order po line or purchase order line it has the attributes purchase order number purchase order purchase order number and purchase order and product number sorry about that this is product number and quantity so PONR is again a foreign key and we are getting its value from the purchase order relation and prod, prod, prod number is the foreign key for which we are getting the value from the product number of the product table right these two are foreign keys and they are taken together for the primary key of PO9 and it has the quantity. So all these tables that we are looking here can be thought of as representing a, a relational data model for the uh, purchase order management system application. Okay. What we have in the next slide, we have uh, an example of the database state. When we say database state, then in the database state, we look at the actual data okay so for supplier you will find the tuples right well, and for supplier um, relation we have these columns as we had in the previous slide right the supplier number supplier name supplier address supplier city and supplier status and we have two tuples here for the supplier named daily wines and best wines right uh, their supplier number 21 and 32 respectively their address their city and status Similarly, we have the relation for product, right, with, with the corresponding, uh, you know, column names and the tuples. Then we have similarly the, the, the relation representing the data for supplies, right. There are two tuples here again. Similarly, we have some tuples for purchase order and purchase order line. Okay. So let me stop right here. I will see you in the next uh, video lecture when we will do the part two of relational database model. Bye bye. Thank you.